Star Wars vs. 40k If ever there was a matchup that perfectly summed up a fandom war of which franchise was the best, this would be the platinum prize. What started it? I don't know, two toughest kids on the block, I guess. Sooner or later, they're gonna fight. Naturally, there have been many people on the internet who have done a variety of different takes on how this conflict would go. From analytical conclusions created by Eckhart's Ladder, war scenarios by VXV Tactics, to even an ongoing story series by a fan with too much time. While intriguing and a fan of both franchises since I was a kid, I never really delved too deeply into what a conflict like this would look like, mainly because such arguments boil down to... Your Emperor is false! Warhammer's just cranked up to 15, it's too extreme for stupid Star Wars! A single bolt around would kill Luke Skywalker. Don't you know they explode on impact? Shut up, fool! Like I was saying. Yeah, you can see my frustration there, especially when the lore masters of the online 40k community, such as Arch Warhammer, tend to go out of their way to lowball Star Wars as a whole, and it largely degrades the hypothetical conflict from a realistic war projection to. Yeah, well, my dad could beat up your dad. No. -uh. Uh huh. Because of this, I don't bother trying to get involved in the discussion, as is the equivalent of bashing your head against the wall made of fan ego and ceramite. And then, my good friend, co-writer, and voice actor Squasher hit me with one hell of an idea. He wanted to run a cogent campaign based around a crossover of Star Wars and 40k. Well, alright. For those who don't know, Kojin was a creation of the YouTuber Shadowversity and his brother that works off a similar concept as D&D, with skills determined by intelligence points, actions determined by the total sum of dice, and being overall flexible that you can basically craft it into anything you want. Want a Space Marine Kojin? We figured it out. Want to run a Starkiller clone? Can do. And after about 7 months of lore creation, team recruiting, and character development, we finally were ready to take this thing out for a test drive. Now, because this is our first time playing, we decided not to record the session as we were just barely getting our feet wet. But enough crazy enough crap happened that I thought, you know what, I'm gonna riff off a little poof and force here, cause this just got nuts. And believe me, you're gonna quickly figure out why. So, with that introductory stuff out of the way, let's get into the campaign on our very first mission, The Gauntlet. Starhammer is set in an alternative version of both Star Wars and 40k, with some deviations in both largely to correct some really, really stupid things that got introduced into both franchises. Because of this, there are, for example, fan factions in 40k, changes to certain events, and more. One of which being the rogue trader ship Serenity accidentally discovering the Celestium Galaxy after attempting to elude the Ministratum forces. There, the rogue traders create a lucrative trading business with the worlds around Vector Prime, until an Inquisitor of the Ordo Xenos discovered what was going on, and the discovery of the entirely new galaxy, apparently untainted by chaos and the Xeno races that now permeated the galaxy. In a moment of rare competence, the High Lords of Terra recognized the strategic boom of acquiring even a portion of this galaxy would benefit the Imperium and began a decades-long preparation for an invasion, including preliminary reconnaissance that ascertained roughly the political structure of the Celestium Galaxy, the massive variety of abhuman and Xenos races, and the use of effectively psychers as political enforcers of the so-called Galactic Republic. In the year 999M41, right during the middle year of the Clone Wars, the Imperium attacked. Six bloody years of war followed as the Imperials cut a massive swath of the Republic, Separatists in hot space, eventually even besieging Coruscant itself. Now, the Imperium's goal wasn't to subjugate the galaxy in its entirety, as that would require far more resources than what the Imperium of the 41st millennium was even remotely capable of providing. Instead, their primary objective was to secure a portion of the galaxy and bring it under Imperial control after launching decapitation strikes against the heads of the two biggest powers, the Republic and the Confederacy. This meant that the Imperials needed to strike hard and fast, and do their damnedest to not destroy every world in their path, no matter how hungrily the angry Sorens of Sigismund really wanted to. Unfortunately, the siege of Coruscant proved to be the turning point of the war. The Imperials, during their ground assault of the planet, would send multiple assassins to eliminate Chancellor Palpatine himself, and this would in turn expose him as Darth Sidious. 
His sudden eruption of power would send shockwaves through the galaxy, stalling the Imperials' advance just enough for the Sith Lord to escape the abyss. Not long after, a joint Republic and Shiss Ascendancy fleet under the command of Admiral Thrawn would arrive to relieve the siege, and this was immediately followed by a Jedi-led assault on Palpatine's fortress world. A bloody war of attrition would follow, which would finally end in the climactic duel of Anakin Skywalker and Palpatine, the Chosen One fulfilling his destiny by striking down the Sith Lord in his palace. In the years that followed, the Great Powers formed a powerful alliance that slowly drove out the Imperial invasion. New weapons, tactics, and technologies allowed them to finally face the Imperials on even footing, and three years after the Battle of Biss, or 15 BBY in the original timeline, victory was declared with the Galactic Concordance, or so everyone thought. It quickly became obvious that the Imperial retreat from the Celestium Galaxy was not entirely due to the Alliance's forces driving them out. After all, military intelligence showed that they were more than capable of digging in and holding the worlds they had taken for potentially decades. But instead, they had completely pulled out. The ruling theory is that something back home caused the Imperial Retreat. Now, something I should note, due to a clerical error, the year 999 is actually 13 years long instead of just one. And any fan of 40k will quickly realize what happened specifically at the end of that year. Now, a decade has passed since the end of hostilities. The Separatists under Count Dooku reformed themselves into the Galactic Dominion, with a new force order called the Dominion Knights created under the influence of the ghosts of Qui-Gon Jinn. The Republic and the Jedi have reformed themselves into the new Galactic Republic and the new Jedi Order, respectively, with the latter having moved their headquarters from Coruscant to Ossus itself. The Chiss has emerged as a new superpower, a Mandalorian confederacy has been formed, and there are talks of the Hutts rekindling the fires of their old empire. Meanwhile, Grand Admiral Thrawn has concluded a years-long spanning project with an ambitious objective, leading a massive armada of 2,000 ships, made up of a joint Republic Dominion Shiss Command. Thrawn plans to lead this expedition into the Milky Way to discover the reason behind the Imperial's retreat, and if possible, make peace with the Imperium. Failing this, they will do their damnedest to prevent it from ever being a threat again. Player characters are a mixture of Republic, Dominion, Chiss, Mandalorian, Droid, Jedi, and Dominion Knight characters, all ranged into various teams depending on the mission we're going to partake in. In the case of this training mission, we had our A-team. Now, not everyone was capable of playing, so we only used three sets of our characters. I play John Rambo, basically transplanted into a Star Wars version who got PTSD from giant fungal people. <laughs> I'm coming to get you. Koopa played a bunch of shiny new clone commandos called Easy Squad, made up of archetypes seen from the A-team including Niner, who's Hannibal but he never went to Nam. I love it when a plan comes together. Ader, who's like B.A. Baracus beat up Seb and stole his armor. Then I take my fist and put my initials on your brain. Gunny, who is literally Hartman from Full Metal Jacket turned into a space Maori. Ah! That's a war face! Now let me see your war face! And Rookie, well, he's basically Donut from Red vs. Blue. I hate you guys. And last but not least, Swords, who played the ex Temple Guard Turkold, who is just a low key star killer that doesn't scream all the time. <laughs> Our training session took place in a holodeck aboard one of the Republic cruisers, more or less styled like the Danger Room from the X Men comics. And almost immediately things went pretty badly. A fight broke out between Rambo and Easy Squad when the cocky ass shinies triggered Rambo's PTSD, and Ader ended up stealing Turkholt's lightsaber when he tried to break up the fight. Yeah, you can imagine how well a man who hates being in a flying spaceship suddenly getting a blue glow stick of death went. Told you I was gonna do it to you next time you try to take on the airplane, didn't I? Before things could get out of hand, Obi-Wan, played by the DM Squasher, showed up to brief us on what we were gonna be facing and what the general objective was. Terminate with extreme prejudice. Before us, the room shifted into a combat arena with towers and walls, and we quickly got into a fighting position. The scenario was that we were surrounded by hordes of enemies advancing on our position, and we'd have to survive three waves of enemies, each one more difficult than the next. 
And he wasn't kidding. Before us, an entire platoon of Def Corps of Krieg suddenly appeared on the opposite side of the room. Spotting us almost immediately, the silent madman opened fire with a volley of las gun fire. Niner his command was returning fire while Turgold moved off to the right to try and flank them. Rambo, however, had positioned himself high up in a tower just before the battle started, and turned on a stealth field generator, turning himself invisible to the Krieger's eyes. At the very back of the platoon, he spotted the enemy command squad, which had a Vox operator, which was about to make a call for fire support. Now, I base Rambo on his appearance in First Blood Part 2 and Rambo 3, meaning he came equipped with his super bow that has the power of plot explosions. Notching an HE arrow, he swiftly blew the Vox operator to smithereens and killed or wounded pretty much everyone else around him. Now, while this normally would have broken the morale of literally everyone else, these are Kriegers and their reaction to seeing their commanders blown up is to pull out their shovels and charge at the clones. Niner and his troopers were swiftly forced to begin pulling back as the Kriegers took ground, trading lives for meters. Turkle apparently spent most of his time running interference, tossing away grenades meant for the clones while Rambo, still on spot in the tower, took game and took out another Krieger armed with a plasma gun. Right when he did this, Turkle decided to jump right into the middle of the entire damn platoon. All right. I run out of patience. Like an inhuman sack clone, the Jedi began ripping and tearing into the gas mask fetishes. The guardsmen throwing themselves at him to try and bury him in numbers. Unfortunately, it didn't work. Jumping clear after bisecting a Creek sergeant armed with a chain sword, we quickly wipe out the rest of the platoon with rockets, grenades, and blaster fire. When in doubt, C4. <laughs> Obi-Wan, impressed by us efficiently handling the Kriegers so well, decided to allow us to choose the next opponent. Rambo decided that because round three was likely going to be something big, blue, and plot armored, we needed to face the hardest thing possible. He chose Kasserkin. It's brilliant. They'll never think we're crazy enough to do it. And you're so crazy, fool. The bodies of the Kriegers suddenly disappeared to be replaced by the live green forms of Cadius Finest. Rather than engaging immediately, the Kaskin split up into two fire teams and smoothly moved to catch the clones in the crossfire. Rambo was still cloaked up in the tower and after relaying their positions to the rest of the men, took aim of the plasma gunner. Now let me explain how we handled Kaskin. While the official lore states that Kasakin are merely humans at peak physical condition, the Dawn of War upgrade system specifically gives them genetic augmentations to make them move like freaking Usain Bolt, and the Eisenhorn novel Malleus depicts Kasakin moving so lightning fast that they appeared like blurs to the Inquisitor, and were even able to briefly tango in close combat with a freaking demon host. Because of that, we wrote Kasakin's stats to be borderline superhuman, and that quickly came to bite me in the ass. Rambo let loose an explosive bolt, and the Kasserkin not only heard the report of the arrow flying, moved fast enough to see it, he actually backflipped out of the way of the explosive with his armor absorbing the concussive force, and every other Kasserkin immediately spotted me up in the tower. Oh shit. The Kasserkin opened fire, disintegrating the tower with grenade and hellgun fire. Rambo ran like hell in the opposite direction and leapt off the tower as it exploded to pieces behind him. Turgold seized him in midair with telekinesis and dragged him across the field while the clones lay down covering fire. Unfortunately, the Kasserkin swiftly suppressed them with their hell guns, the high-powered lasers quickly dropping the commando's body shields down to just a single volley. Switching tactics, the clones equipped their rocket launcher attachments began firing them at the Cadians, but the Kasserkin either moved too fast to hit them, or they just simply took cover. Then the plasma gunner rose and fired a superheated bolt at the clone's position. Stop! Turkold had maxed out his telekinetic abilities, and because the plasma was a physical mass of electromagnetic energy, he was able to literally grab the bolt in midair and then throw it back at the Kasserkin. The plasma gunner, though, was swiftly able to roll out of the way as the shot disintegrated a wall, the sergeant shouting, A WITCH! The second fire team opened up on Turkold and Rambo's position, blasting them with hellgun fire, which Turkold was barely able to deflect due to how damn fast the bolts were moving. Then they tossed in a cloud of grenades, the Jedi using his telekinesis to throw them away and won back at one of the Cadians. The blast blew off his leg, but his comrades were swiftly able to pull him back into cover and continue laying down suppressing fire. 
That was when the Vox operator decided to call in an artillery strike. Broken arrow! Above, the skies darkened with the thunderous approach of heavy munitions, the shells casting dark shadows over the training room. Turgold raised his hands against the skies and called upon every ounce of power he had to block, deflect, and destroy the incoming shells when Rambo and the clones desperately tried to cover him. The Kassigan swiftly took advantage of the slow to close in, firing more rounds as the plasma gunner stopped the commandos. Rambo started hurling explosives at the Kassigan, finally getting lucky with a flashbang and blinding four of the Cadians, including their Vox operator. Turkle then reached out and grabbed the plasma gunner right as he fired another shot at the commandos, pulling him across the map into the waiting arms of Jango Fett's sons. Rather than trying to penetrate his armor with their blasters, the commandos instead dogpiled the Kassigan and stabbed him to death like he was named Caesar. Now the battle swung back in our favor, with Rambo tossing another grenade aided by the Jedi and forcing a fire team out of cover. There, the Jedi pulled them over and decapitated them, with Rambo putting rounds into their bodies to make sure they stayed dead. From there, the same strategy of just burying the survivors in ordnance fallen until everything stopped moving. Blow the shit out of it. Blow the shit out of it. Blow the shit out of it. Once again, Obi-Wan congratulated the team, and begrudgingly, fearfully, Rambo asked if their final opponent would be a space marine. He answered, yes. Before the match started, Rambo laid down a minefield right in front of where the Astaris would appear, and everyone hunkered down behind cover with good firing lanes ahead. Rambo raised explosive bow, the clones their rockets, and the Jedi his lightsaber. Then suddenly, a blue armored form of an ultramarine teleported right in front of us. He turned inhumanly fast, and spotted us in the Jedi. In a flash, he produced a bolt pistol and fired, the rounds cracking like thunder as Turkle barely threw up a barrier to block the incoming fire. Before we could even blink, the Astarius drew a power sword and charged, his monstrous weight echoing as he leapt across the battlefield like a grizzly after honey. The mines Rambo had lain at his feet exploded one by one, the NI personnel mines practically doing nothing but scratching his arm as he poured on bolter fire. Then, as he closed to 30 feet, Turco let open a hole in his defense and we took our chance. The clones fired their rockets, Rambo fired off a shape-charged arrow, the projectiles flew and struck, a massive fireball erupting and... the space marine died. No, I'm not kidding. The Astarius rolled so poorly that every explosive struck him in the chest, stacked, penetrated, and blew open his entire torso and threw him across the arena. Now, to make it clear, we did not expect this to happen. Instead, we expected this. Or this. And probably this. But instead, this happened. Immediately after, Grand Admiral Thrawn walked in, utterly impressed, and said we had passed our test with flying colors. Because seriously, that Astaris should have killed all of us. <coughs> Afterwards, high fives were exchanged, respect was earned, Rambo promised to buy everyone drinks, and the players signed off, content, laughing, and, well, nonetheless a little surprised. While Squash and I prepped next week's training session specifically for our droid characters. And believe me, that was just as nuts. Death comes in shadows. Conclusion. You have just shown me your soft, meatbag-like underbellies and said, HK-47, please shoot me repeatedly there until I die. <laughs> <laughs>